I told Beautiful. our team this morning, you're not allowed into those buildings yet, okay? Because unless you're volunteering and you have a background check, you don't go into You're going to get tased. You will get tased, but... But they're trained. We don't mind if you walk up and look in the glass. All right. So Mighty Movers, you can clearly see it, man. It has been remodeled. All but new carpet and new carpet will go in very soon. But all the walls are done. It is beautiful there. Our office used to be right outside of this door, and it was our smallest building out here. That was the admin office. That office was completely gutted, and we completely remodeled LG4, and LG4 became the new office. All right. Woo! We're excited because we work in that every day. That's right. So. <laughs> so a lot of our staff, we basically all took on projects, and mm. we just made it killed happen. It. Killed it. Staff came in and killed it themselves, painting, staining, scrubbing floors, making it all possible. Volunteers came in yesterday and worked tirelessly, guys, to make this all possible. And you say, why did you do all of that? Well, let me tell you why. Because our life group buildings are all getting ready to be moved. All four of the life group buildings were huh? supposed to have been moved. What? Why are we moving the life rooms? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to, like, capture their emotions right oh, now. Oh, you so are? Okay. To, they're okay. trying to process why are we moving the life okay, rooms. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna trying tell to help you. you out. My hands are dirty from the rocks. <laughs> so, last Thursday, we were supposed to have moved all those buildings. But due to the rain, if you live in our area, we got two inches of rain and it delayed us. But tomorrow morning, all four life rooms that are out there are all getting moved over by the creek. And here's why. That area over there is going to be called Life Village by the creek. And it will be like city streets. It's going to have cobblestone down the middle. It's going to have beautiful vintage lights that are going to be hung. It is going to be a beautiful space for the adults who show up who want to connect and want to grow. So as of Tuesday night, when you roll in here, Tuesday night for life groups, and Wednesday night, all you adults, you're going over to Life Village by the creek. It's going to be a process of all the cobblestone and all the sidewalks, but we're getting them moved because we had a little window like this when life groups were on break. And when life groups are on break, that's when we got to make to all the magic happen, all right? So we cannot thank all the volunteers enough, honestly, from the bottom of our heart. As pastors, if it wasn't for volunteer power in a church, you can't make it go. It takes volunteers giving of themselves. But can I tell you something? You didn't do it for us, and you didn't do it for this church. You did it for the kingdom of God. You did it for God, and all glory goes to God. It's all about life change, and that's what we're going to see happen. So speaking of life change, today is a day for life change. We are anticipating, I hope you are expecting great things to come because the Word of God is about to be preached in His house this morning. And our prayer for you all week has been that God would open up your hearts and get you ready to receive what Word He has for you today because God wants to speak to your heart, and he wants to speak into your life, and he wants to see his promises for your life come to pass. I don't know who you are, but you need to hear this. There's hope. His name is Jesus. Who is ready for the word of God today? Amen. Come on, mountain movers. You can do better than that. Come on. So uh, we, are, we are so privileged today to have special guests with us um, from Jeff City, Missouri. And uh, these are dear, dear friends of ours. They come from, I knew them prior to uh, camp back in JC. We went to the same home church together, Solid Rock. But we also go to camp together. And they are, many times, they are our head counselors. And they come through the dorms with like, like bullhorns and coffee. It's kind of like a bittersweet, like, get up out of bed, but here's some coffee if you want some coffee. I mean, it's like a bittersweet. It's kind of a rude awakening, but it's kind of sweet once you get the Irish creamer going. So uh, they are wonderful. They love God, and we are so excited to have Chad and Lindsay Horton in the house today. So give them a Mount Movers welcome, Brother Chad. Come on, bring the word, brother. Love you, man. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap, everybody. Give Jesus a good one. Amen. On occasion, I get the opportunity to go to other churches, and, uh, and the one thing I always realize is that uh, it makes me appreciate what I've got back home, um, but I always realize that uh, when, when we've got, we, we get comfort, a comfort level with what we see every week, right? Amen? And so, can I tell you just for a moment that, uh, that I'm not just saying this because they're my friends, but Brad and Misty are rock stars, and I hope you guys never, never miss that, Okay. And what, what you've got going here on this little corner of terra firma 
in northwest, northeast Oklahoma, I'm going to tell you, is, is spiritual and it's moving and it's changing the world for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I was just standing over there and as, as soon as the worship began, I just began to weep. And I just, I just felt that the Spirit was moving and that He's doing things in people's lives. And man, I'm just grateful just to be a little small part of that, you know? And, um, and I've, I've, we've had a pretty cool weekend. We, I've had a few firsts this weekend. I wanted to speak to you just for a few moments this morning about marking your moments and your middles. Marking your moments and your middles. Pastor Brad was trying to do that a while ago. He was trying to mark the moment. He was trying to capture the emotion of the moment, right? Well, we've had a few firsts, me and my family, this weekend. Um, we, uh, let's see, on Friday night driving down, I got to see my first bull riding rodeo, and I watched A.J. Helton. Uh, I think I got a picture of A.J., uh, I watched my first bull ride and of people like coming off bloody and horns to the head, and it was, it was pretty interesting. Did you have that picture there, Kara? Did that come up? Um, there we go. There he is. There's AJ coming out of the chute, and about 1.4 seconds later, he's on the ground. But, but it was awesome. It was awesome. That was a first for me. That was the first for me. Uh, yesterday morning, we got to get up, and I caught my very first spoonbill. My daughter caught her very first spoonbill. Check this thing out, 55 pounds, which to me, I mean, that weighed more than two of both of my dogs put together, so that was pretty impressive. That was a first for me as well, and, um, and this morning, I get to preach my very first sermon. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> somebody's thinking, I hope he's kidding. <laughs> I hope he's joking about it. No, I've preached a few, but, this, but I'll tell you that every one feels like the very first one because I, I am very jealous when it comes to the real estate that Sunday mornings have in my life and have in your life because I believe that every Sunday morning never is routine. It is always an opportunity for God to move in your life, for God to change things in your life, for God to mark a moment and say, from this day forth, I remember that Sunday. Amen? And I believe that that can be this today. Amen? All right, if you want to start turning to Joshua chapter 3, the very end of Joshua chapter 3, that's where we're going to land. We're going to start there. Um, we're going to work into chapter 4 as well. Um, in, in theater, there's a term that's called marking the moment in theatric terms. And it's a technique that, that the producers and directors use to emphasize a particular or a significant moment in a scene or a movie. It can be done either through freeze frame, you know, where, where the, the scene is moving along and then it stops and they freeze frame it. Sometimes they can use music to create a moment and you realize that something is happening that I need to be start paying attention to, that something is significant that's going to be coming up later in the movie. Sometimes they do this with slow motion. I love slow motion. Care if you want to hit that because we all love videos of dogs eating ice cream, right? Dogs eating ice cream is amazing by itself, but when you slow-mo it, amen, that's my chocolate lab Charlie Brown. God love him. We lost him right before Christmas last year. He's an awesome, that's my youngest son Brooks in the back photobombing, wishing, he's like, dude, that's my ice cream. What's going on? Um, but that marks the moment, right? And they do that with slow motion in movies as well. So when something like that happens, you know that this is a significant moment. And if you miss that moment that the director is trying to mark, you may be confused later on in the movie. And you'll be one of those annoying people who are sitting next to you saying, hey, what happened there? What does that mean? And you're like, watch the movie, Lindsay. <laughs> I'm good. I'm kidding. My wife, my wife's a movie lover. She watches movies all the time. But depending on the night, we're five minutes in, and she's like, she's marking her own moment. <laughs> but uh, but so Jesus made a habit of marking moments. Jesus made a habit of marking moments with the disciples. One of the most significant moments um, it was when he was enjoying a final dinner with his disciples. And, and that night and the next day, his trial was going to begin and he was going to be arrested. And he knew that just a few days later, he was going to be in a grave and that this was going to be very confusing to the disciples. He knew that, that when they saw him up on that cross, that they were going to be saying to themselves, this was how this movie was supposed to go and they were going to need to be able to refer back to something that said he 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 said something about this so he marked a moment with them that we call the last supper and it instituted a wonderful uh, spiritual element into our churches called communion 
where he said, take this bread and remember that it was my body that was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He said, take this cup. This is the blood that I'm going to shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He was marking that moment. He didn't want them to forget that because there was going to come a confusing time that they're going to need something to be able to hang on to, Brad, that they're going to want to go back to and say, I remember that he said something about this. He referenced this in the past, and that gives me strength and wisdom and, and motivation to get through the middle that I'm stuck in right now. Amen. Can somebody give Jesus an amen on that? Amen. So, so a, a, as a parent, as I write this message like this, I'm convicted about not marking more moments in my children's lives and seeing times. Amen. I got any parents that wish they could go back and mark a few more moments and realize the significance of those. But today we're going to be working from a, from a very significant moment in the life of a very significant man named Joshua who led the nation of Israel into the the, the infamous, the famous promised land that you may have heard talked about in the Bible. So in Joshua chapter 3, I want to give you the backstory. So I want to give you, keeping with our theatric theme for a moment, I want to give you the context that this story comes to us in. You see, Joshua, in this story, you're going to see Joshua leading the nation of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land. But 40 years earlier, God had tried to do this once before. God tried to take them where he wanted them before. And Joshua was one of the only guys that said, guys, let's go. We can take this thing. God has promised it to us, and that's all I need. Everybody else was like, oh, I don't know. They're big. They're scary. It's a big land. Joshua's like, dude, come on. Let's go. But God said, okay, fine. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So Joshua has had 40 years of frustration wandering in a place that he knew he shouldn't be in okay and so and then after this story that we're going to see here there's also interestingly enough another 35 to 40 years depending on the commentary of of destination where joshua is in the promised land and he's conquering things that god said they were going to conquer and they're accomplishing things that god promised him that they were going to accomplish so it's really interesting that we are right here smack in the middle between 40 years of joshua's frustration and then we're going to watch and see where he gets into his 35 to 40 years of his destination but right here, at the end of chapter 3 and verse 4, we're going to see the transformation. And I love when God lines up a message with the, 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 the verbiage that you've been using and speaking this week, the transformation that is happening on this campus, the excitement and energy that that brings. We're going to see Joshua moving through his middle and through the transformation that God wanted to do earlier, but now we're going to see him doing now. So let's read at the end of Joshua chapter 3. If you've got your Bible or your device, you've got it pulled up on your phone or something, just say amen. In chapter 3, verse 14, it says, So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, that was this big fancy thing that they carried ahead of them, it represented the Spirit of God, the presence of God. It went ahead of them. And verse 15, now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. And I wrote in my Bible, well, of course it is. Right? If God's going to say, I'm going to take you and I'm going to cross this, I'm going to make you be able to cross this Jordan, of course it's going to be at flood stage. Why wouldn't it? If you're ready to pour some, some sidewalks, why wouldn't it rain two inches? Come on, somebody. Right? So God likes the shock and all. So the, now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. We're going to come back in just a second. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. Everybody say Adam. We're going to circle back to that. In the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah was completely cut off, so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle. Everybody say middle. 
in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And the church said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for your living, breathing word, this document you have put in our hands. Father, I pray that you do something in this message I cannot do today. God, dissect it hundreds of ways so it affects all of us individually and specifically right where we are today, Father. I am simply your pawn. Let no words be of my own. God, it is your spirit moving in this word. In Jesus' name, the church said. I love how it says, as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped. I don't want you to underestimate the power of first movement. Do not underestimate the power of that first step because the toughest step most often is the heart, is the first one, right? The toughest one is the first one. And listen, friends, sometimes if you're needing a miracle, if you're needing God to move in situation today, sometimes your move comes ahead of your miracle. Your step precedes God's movement sometimes. The, the, I want you to notice the progression. Don't get the progression confused. It said the priest stepped and the water stopped. It didn't say the water stopped. They looked around, coast is clear, now I'll step. Friends, if you're doing that, you're going to be waiting a long time. God wants to see your faith. God wants to see you step out in faith. And he says, look what I will do if you will take that first step. Amen. So the priest stepped and the waters stopped. Don't underestimate the power of the first movement. And also, I want you to recognize that there is power in your progress. This whole campus is in progress right now. But there's power in the progress. We learn and we grow during these steps. Amen? These things enlarge us. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, um, it says, we got it up there. Go ahead and put it up because I don't want to turn. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance your faith that step produces perseverance now check the process verse number four let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature progress and complete progress not lacking anything there's a progress there's there's a process that god wants to take us through we're never finished this campus is never going to be finished it's always going to be a work in progress because there's always going to be more souls to save There's always going to be more ground to gain. Amen? We never actually make it. Um, The the, the verse, the the scripture references being complete, being perfect. And I love, if you do a word study on this word perfect in the Bible, it's not like the English sense of perfect that we think of without blemish and without spot. It's in the Greek, the word perfect simply means finished, Ty. Finished. What Jesus, what was the last words Jesus spoke on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. He doesn't need you to be perfect, friend. He just needs you to never give up. Just don't stop stepping. Don't stop progressing. God wants to you wants you to work through some things. God wants you to go through his process. He wants you to finish this race. You don't have to finish first, but just finish the race. Don't give up on me. Paul Paul in uh, Corinthians, he was talking about the thorn in his side. He wasn't perfect, but he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Amen. That's what Jesus wants you to do. Don't worry about the progress that you're making. Don't worry that you think you ought to be farther ahead than you are today, friend. If you're making progress, if you're taking steps, God's going to bless those steps today in your life. Amen. Amen. I love, so God wants us working through some things. God just doesn't remove everything in front of us. God wants us to push through some things. God didn't just dry up the Jordan River before they ever got there. Amen? In Luke, I love Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. This is so encouraging to me, and somebody needs to get this today. This is Jesus talking to Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, we got it up there. Ha- Satan, check this out. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. So Jesus said, Peter, listen, Satan actually came to me, and he wanted your head on a platter. 
He wanted to sift you as wheat. Check this out. But I have prayed for you. Man, that does my spirit good, knowing that my Savior, that Jesus Christ, the intercessor for me between me and God, is praying for me. And look what he prayed. He didn't pray, Peter, I prayed that everything would be removed from your way. I, he, didn't, I, he didn't pray that all of your mother and father-in-laws would, would move far away. He didn't pray that. He said, Peter, I prayed that your faith may not fail. Not that I'm going to take all those rocks away. I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. And think about this. Peter's, in our book, Peter's faith did technically fail. In my mind, he denied Jesus three times, right? I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Here's what's encouraging to me. Jesus didn't look at that as failure. I can stumble and still be in his grace. So Jesus says, Peter, I prayed that your faith did not fail. It's going to falter. But it's not going to fail. He says, I prayed for you. And look why. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He says, I'm praying for you to come through the process, Misty. I'm not just going to hand everything over to you. I'm going to pray you through the process so that when you come out on the other side, you can reach back and you can encourage your brothers and sisters that are coming through the same things. Amen. (laughs) Whoo, Man, that does my heart good today. Man, that does me good. Your greatest ministry to someone is is helping them through what you just came through. Your greatest misery can become your greatest ministry at some point. You are not disqualified by your sinful past. Your sinful past may actually qualify you for ministry opportunities to sit down with somebody at a dinner and say, man, that must stink that you just lost your teenage son to suicide. But I've been there, and I know what that's like. There's, there's power in having been there. That's a whole other sermon. I can't go there, but, man, there's power in that. So, because Peter's shadow... If you keep reading Peter's story, Peter's shadow is going to fall on sick people and they're going to get healed, okay? So Jesus knows this. He says, Peter, if you will push through the transition that you're in right now, if you can push through this frustrating time, I got moments for you that are going to mark your life that you have no idea the power of them yet, amen? I'm believing that for this church today. I declare that right now, that if you keep pushing through this transformation, this transitional process, your imagination cannot come up with the crazy things that Jesus is going to do right here on this campus in the future. Amen? All right. I got to hurry. Read. Let's go to chapter 4. So they've crossed the Jordan River. And now in chapter 4, verse 1, we're reading the actual uh, scenario when it happens. 4 verse 1, when the whole nation had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle. Everybody say middle. From the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. You see, God instructed Joshua to create a memorial, to mark that moment. God knew that this was a significant moment in Joshua's movie. And he wanted to make sure that the rest of history, that the rest of the nation, as people walked by, that they would be able to retell the story. So he said, pick up 12 stones and carry them from the middle of the Jordan River and take them over to the other side. (laughs) I mean, I love that. I love the promise that is implied in that. I'm getting you to the other side, Misty. It may not, you don't know how you're getting there yet, friend, but I promise you, you're getting there. And when you get there, I want you to mark the moment with the uh, celebration and the sobriety that it, that it uh, deserves. So he tells them to pick up 12 stones, carry them through the, Jor- the, the Jordan River to set them up on the other side. And this is where the story stops and the preaching usually starts about marking moments and setting up memorials so that you don't forget things. But in the last few minutes that I have with you today, I wanted to share with you something that God showed with me and just blew my doors off. Just cracked my universe wide open because there was two memorials that were set up that day. 
There was one memorial that was set up that gets a lot of the fanfare. It gets a lot of talk. It's mentioned three or four different times within this couple of chapters of text. But there was another memorial that was set up that day. You see, but this second memorial doesn't get nearly the fanfare that the first one does. But I think depending on where you are in your life today, it can have even more significance and more power for you. You see, verse number 8, I want to read verse number 8. It says, so the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down and they created a memorial so that over the years in history as people would walk by people would be able to retell the story of how God delivered the nation of Israel into the promised land and this is where it happened and this was the memorial for the masses but verse number nine shows us that there's a memorial that was set up just for me you see in verse number nine it says Joshua also set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. This is the only verse that reflects this. Now, I want to set this context again, keeping with our cinematic theatric theme here. I want to set this mood here. The nation of Israel, about 1.52 million people, have gone through the Jordan River on dry ground. That amazes me. He just dried up the water. What's a, what's a riverbed look like for weeks after the water's gone? Sloppy mess, right? <laughs> Two inches of rain. But it was dry ground. So the nation of Israel has gone through. The Ark of the Covenant is now moving on. Joshua is now kind of in this middle by himself. You know, kind of after a, a big event, and you're just kind of on campus here, Brad Misty, and you're just kind of, <sighs> wow. And you've got that decompression moment. This is, this is this moment for Joshua. He finds himself in the middle, and he's like, wow. What just happened? What did God just do? It's quiet. The cattle, the, the horses, the people have all moved out. And they've carried the stones over. And now Joshua is sitting in the middle of this middle that represents the transition from 40 years of his frustration moving into his 40 years of destination. And he finds himself right here in this beautiful, tender moment that I want to spend our last few moments dissecting. You see, this one reflects his testimony. The, the one on the gr- on this bank that everybody's going to see, that's going to be his testimony of what God did here. But this one that he's setting up in the Jordan River is representative of his testing. There was a memorial that was left in the river that day. And verse number eight shows us that when God's taking you through the middle of something, there are some things that he wants you to pick up and carry through. But verse number nine shows us that there are also some things that God wants you to put down and bury. Some things we want to carry, but some things we need to bury. There are some stones that God will instruct you to pick up along the way and carry through with you. Then there are some stones that, friends, we just need to leave in the middle. We need to leave those things in the middle, and we need to drop them in the middle and let those waters flood back over them and just completely take them out of our lives. Amen. Somebody with me? Somebody with me today? So let me... So let me help somebody today. If God is trying to get you to the promised land of peace, he's trying to get you through a transition of a crazy, chaotic time, but he's trying to get you to peace, you can't carry it and pick up and carry the stones of bitterness and frustration. You can't carry those into your promised land. Amen? They have no place. Amen? If God is trying to get you into the promised land of financial prosperity... And, 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 and just being able to pay your bills on time, you cannot pick up the stones of bad spending habits and credit cards. And you can't carry those into your promised land. Amen? If you start doing that, you're never going to get there. 
There are some things that God does intend for you to pick up, but there are some things that God says, I'm bringing you through this so that you can drop some baggage, friend. Man, come on, somebody. He wants you to leave some things. If he's trying to get you into the land of forgiveness... You haven't been able to forgive somebody for what they did? You can't carry the stone of bitterness. You can't carry that into your promised land. If I keep going, friend, if I had enough time, I'd get to you eventually. I promise I would. But what is it that God is bringing you through today that you've been trying to drag things along with you? Come on. That God has been asking you to leave. I believe, touch somebody and say, you can't bring that in here. Touch somebody, you can't bring that in here. You can't bring that into your promised land. I believe, I believe Joshua that day, I believe Joshua was leaving some things in the middle that day. I believe Joshua, every one of those stones were representative to Joshua. He had 40 years of frustration. God was getting ready to move him into a high level of leadership. And God knew that there were things that Joshua could not bring with him into this new level of leadership. Joshua, if anybody, has got good, he's got big stones, man. He's got things, he's got 40 years of I told you guys so, right? And he can't carry that into the promised land with him because that's going to, to, to cause his leadership to be inferior. It's going to cause him to miss things. He might not even make it. If I'm trying to carry all this baggage, I might not even make it where God's wanting to take me. Joshua, if anybody had stones that he had justification to carry, but he was visibly, physically leaving things there in the middle that he knew he couldn't take into the promised land. Friend, your past problems can potentially poison your promise if you don't drop them in the middle. If you're struggling in the middle today, it may be because you're carrying stones that God wanted you and intended for you to leave. But there are things that we do bring through. There are stones that God wants us to carry through and take to the other side. The stone of the experience that I have. It makes me stronger. If it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. God taught me things in the middle that I never knew before. He showed me new levels of faith that I'm going to carry into my promised land. Amen? These stones represent the testimony that I'm bringing with me. And these things are going to make my burden light. They're not going to make my burden heavy. If your burden's heavy today, friend, you might be carrying the wrong stones. Check what you're carrying today. Because there are things that God does want us to carry through. He wants to carry the stone of testimony over there. He wants us to have the the stone of experience. And see what we learned during that transitional and that transformational moment. You see, when you're in the middle... It's tough to see the reason why you should memorialize it. But if you take that time and you mark it while you're there, there's power in marking that moment. Joshua could have got over to the other side. Okay, let's see how God works this out. Okay, we win. Great. Now I'm going to go back and mark it. No. You have to see it when you're there. There's power in marking the moment. And there, we need to celebrate the strength that comes from our struggle. There's strength that comes from your struggle today celebrate that celebrate what god does marking your moments involves both a an element of celebration and sobriety celebrating what it was that god has done but sober enough somberly somberly knowing that without god none of it would have happened none of it would have been possible you see I'm jealous for every single Sunday, like I said, because I believe that every single Sunday is an opportunity for you to mark your moments. There are moments that mark your life, moments when you realize that nothing is ever going to be the same. And as I close, I want to share this with you, that there are times in your life where your life is going to be marked by that moment, where time will forever be divided into two parts. Before this and after this. Our calendars are like this. B.C., A.D., B.C., before Christ. A.D., after the year of our Lord. When Jesus came onto the earth, nothing was ever the same again. And I believe that it can be the same with you today. Jesus changes everything and nothing else will. 
So I believe today can be your moment. I believe that today God brought you here this Sunday morning to hear this message from Jeff City, Missouri, because you've been struggling through that middle, and maybe now you realize there's some stones that you've, been, you've hid away in your bag that have been weighing you down. God's saying, I'm not asking you to go all the way. I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to take the next step. I'm asking you to move with me. This can be your time. Joshua chapter 4, verse 14, after they've crossed over, it says, That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. That day. That was the day that God exalted Joshua over all of Israel. Amen? And I believe that it can be for you today. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I'm so grateful for this message. I thank you for this word, God. I thank you for stopping the waters for Israel and showing me that, God, you will step in and stop my waters as long as I can take that faithful first step. God, I thank you for the times that you have brought me through the middle. I thank you for the times where when I couldn't see you and I couldn't trace you, I could still trust you. Father, I'm praying for those that are in here this morning that have been struggling through the middle. I'm praying that today that they have found encouragement knowing that you, Jesus, are our intercessor, that you pray for us, that you oversee us, that you want good things for us, God. And I thank you for bringing this word to us for a timely message where everything can be this, everything can change in a moment. Now, with everyone's heads down and eyes closed, if you're you're in the room and and you know that this message was for you today, that you've been moving through those transitional moments and it's just been a struggle, that it's, it's been in the middle and you haven't been able to mark the middle, you've just been mad about the middle. Can you just put your hand in the air right now? I just want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See those hands, Father. Father, right now, for every hand representing a frustrating situation in a life, God, I'm praying for life-changing moments right now into those hands that are raised. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit that promises that you never leave us nor forsake us, God, I pray that you are moving in their lives right now. Father, I pray that whatever situation that they are in, I'm praying that you begin showing them moments that are going to be so significant, God. I I hope they begin carrying the stones that you have designed for them to carry. Give them the strength and the wisdom and the calm and the peace. I'm, I'm praying peace for a frustrated heart right now. Peace over a heart that has not been able to find peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now while everyone's heads down and still eyes closed, everything that I've shared with you today, friend, has no bearing unless you have taken a first step, which is accepting Jesus as the Savior of your life so, so that He is guiding your steps. And if you've never made that decision before, Today is the day that marks that moment in your life where everything can be different from this day forward, where your life will be forever changed before this and after this. And if you've never asked Jesus in your heart before and you know today is the day that you want to do that, all you have to do is repeat a prayer with us. And if you want to do that today and you've never done it, just raise your hand real quick. Nobody's looking around. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. There's one. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can put those hands down. Church, for the sake of those accepting Jesus for the very first time, will you repeat this prayer with me and with them? Say, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. God, I believe that the death of the cross paid for my sin. I believe that your blood is remission for my sins. Thank you for giving your life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name. Can the church give him a big hand clap today? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. 
or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.